My name is Brad Tito. I'm the Director of Sustainability for the City of Yonkers. On behalf of Mayor Mike Spano, welcome to our second Green Standards Information Session. So joining me today is Commissioner Bill Schneider of our Department of Housing and Buildings. He's the top building inspector, code official, whatever you want to call him. He's the guy who's uh, enforcing the building code as well as enforcing these green standards in downtown. Also joining us is our esteemed planning director, Lee Elman, who is all things planning and zoning, and he can go over some of the uh, requirements of green standards as well as live work uh, closer to the end of the presentation. So last year, Mayor Mike Spano launched Yonkers Green City. Uh, this is a community-led initiative where literally thousands of individuals, businesses, and government officials are making great progress building an even more healthy, vibrant, and attractive city for all those who live in and work in and visit Yonkers. So whether it's recently completed energy efficiency upgrades to city buildings, the city's LED streetlight project, or our citywide water meter replacement program, or even solar streamlining. There's a really a great momentum building around sustainability in Yonkers, and the results are remarkable. Uh, city taxpayers are on track to save $20 million in energy costs over 10 years, and we're cutting the carbon footprint of government operations by 12%. And the city's green development program, it's an important element of Yonkers Green City. And so today I'll be talking about the green, green development program. It's interchangeable with green standards. We're talking about the same program. Uh, and then we'll follow that with a discussion related to live work requirements in downtown. So what exactly is green development? Well, it's new construction and renovation projects that protect the environment create healthier, more comfortable buildings, reduce strains on overburdened infrastructure, and we're really talking about projects that result in lower operating costs. And it covers a wide range of issues spanning energy, environment, and health. So in Yonkers, we've calculated the carbon footprint of the city as a whole. And we find that two-thirds of our greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. So today, when the UN is meeting on the important issue of climate, it's important to recognize that to address climate change, all levels of government, the private sector and the public, need to engage in a coordinated and sustained effort. And again, two thirds of our greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. So the takeaway here is that we can make dramatic progress on climate change, but only if we design our buildings to be more sustainable. So why should we embrace green building? Well, I've talked about our carbon footprint, but you know, even if you're less concerned about climate change, if you're skeptical about climate change, there's no question that the costs of energy, water, and waste disposal are increasing at dramatic rates. And if we can find ways to use our resources more efficiently, we can reduce costs and we can avoid expensive infrastructure upgrades paid for with public money or private money. So what's more, and this may be the most important point, is that our communities will be successful to the extent that they are healthy, vibrant, and attractive places that people want to live and they want to locate their businesses. And we're not alone in adopting green standards. According to the US Green Building Council, there are literally hundreds of local, state, and federal green building initiatives. Programs vary widely. Some are voluntary, some are mandatory, some are incentive-based. There's lots of different approaches. But you can see there are many nearby local governments that require some private development to adhere to green building standards. And in Yonkers, we started with green building legislation several years ago. Now the city's green building program was first approved in December of 2011 as part of the rezoning of downtown Yonkers. But the history goes back 
to 2008 when the city council first approved legislation that would require most renovation and construction projects throughout Yonkers to meet LEED certification. That's Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, another very well-known green building standard. Uh, that piece of legislation was vetoed by the prior administration. They said at the time that it was unenforceable and that it was illegal. The counsel we received from the Pace University Land Use Law Center and our own uh, city attorneys in the Corporation Council, they advised that we'd be better served creating our own Yonkers specific standard and enforcing it locally rather than sending the plans and specifications to Washington DC to the US Green Building Council's office for them to approve or disapprove of your development project. So back to the rezoning in December of 2011, the rezoning actually increased the development potential of downtown by three million square feet. And this policy was approved to mitigate the environmental impacts of this new development and to reduce strains on the city's overburdened infrastructure. We have made um, practically everything in terms of zoning and development permissions, uh, planning permissions in the downtown uh, easier. So the, the parking uh, standards have gone down. You need to provide less parking. We saw that as an available opportunity because there is a railroad station right outside uh, the door here. Uh, a lot of, uh, obviously, we've, we've seen that uh, something like 50% of the people who live immediately around the uh, railroad station are commuters using the railroad to go to uh, jobs elsewhere. Uh, you don't, if they're, if they're attracted to that kind of a lifestyle, they don't need to uh, have cars, therefore we don't need to make the development community spend $35,000, $40,000 uh, a space um, to, to create parking. Um, we have opened up the size of the, of, of the lots in the sense that we used to have a very suburban development standard, zoning standard in the downtown requiring that you have setbacks uh, all, around the, all around the building. Um, you know, one of the things you learn as you begin to uh, approach a very urban kind of zoning is that people go to other places, other countries, uh, to find that, that tight urban fabric that we created in downtown Yonkers a hundred years ago, that we got away from in the suburbanization days after the Second World War, and that we're realizing uh, it doesn't make sense to have space between buildings uh, for any reason other than um, health and safety, fire, fire purposes. Uh, so that means that, that every lot in downtown is incrementally more usable than it was five years ago. So fast forward to March of 2012, Mayor Spano convened a work group to develop a set of standards that ultimately became the Yonkers Green Development Workbook. This is really the central document to our entire green standards program. If there's one thing you take away, it's that you need to look at the Green Development Workbook to understand what's required and how uh, to uh, apply these standards. Now, in May of 2013, the mayor introduced and the city council unanimously approved the Yonkers Green Building Ordinance. And this established a policy for the city to design and construct city-owned buildings, our own buildings, to meet, uh, meet the green standards. And we'd also encourage private developers to do the same. And now that the, city, uh, the standards have proven successful, the time has come to fully implement section 43, 222 of the city code, which calls for green building standards in downtown Yonkers. Now, the green development standards were developed by the Yonkers Green Development Standards Work Group. Now, this consisted of building industry professionals, leaders in the civic, business, and environmental communities here in Yonkers, and we set about creating standards 
that met a few important criteria. We wanted them to be measurable, effective, clear, enforceable, and reasonable. And we wanted to make sure, as a practical matter, that the standards would work well no matter what kind of building, whether it was residential or non-residential, and no matter what kind of project, whether it was a construction, a new construction, a gut rehab, or, or just even a small, moderate rehab project. So we looked at a number of different standards, including LEED, like I mentioned before, but also the International Green Construction Code, Green Globes, and another one, Enterprise Green Communities. Now, Enterprise Green Communities is a green building standard developed for the affordable housing sector by enterprise community partners. And this was adopted as the basis of the Yonkers standard. So what we liked about this standard, the standard was attractive because cost reduction was a major focus. Now studies have shown a slight increase in cost, but that this added cost was more than offset by utility savings over time. Now, LEED certified projects, on the other hand, a significant portion of the added cost is in fees, commissioning, and other soft costs. You have to hire out consultants and they have to certify and verify everything that you do. These things don't really have anything to do with the building's performance. And what we wanted uh, to achieve with these standards was if you're going to spend money on these, on these features, these green features, we wanted you to be spending the money on the green features, not on hiring a number of consultants. So what we liked about Enterprise is that they tried to eliminate these costs. It's also very easy to understand and to use not only for people putting in for building permit applications, but also for the building department uh, and their inspectors so that we're not bogged down, confused, what is this all about? What are, what's the clear, you know, what's the objective? Those objectives are made clear in the standards. So, our work group made a number of important changes to the Enterprise Green Community Standard. They were expanded to include non-residential buildings. We made it local. For example, the energy performance standards were made to align with NYSERDA grant programs. That's the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. They have grant programs if you build more energy efficient than is required by code and you meet their standards, you can receive generous incentives. So if you build according to our standards, you are eligible for those state incentives. There's no conflict, they align. Uh, similarly, in regard to stormwater, we gave points for green infrastructure elements which are listed in the New York State Stormwater Design Manual, like rain gardens and green roofs, which you can use to comply with state and local stormwater regulations. So it's a set of standards designed specifically for Yonkers that maximizes the amount of grant funding you can receive for your project. So the final product was the Yonkers Green Development Workbook, which is available at the easy URL, yonkersny.gov slash green standards. So I encourage you all to go to yonkersny.gov slash green standards and download the Yonkers Green Development Workbook. And the workbook includes a green development checklist and standards. Now I brought copies of the checklist, I think most of you have it. Um, the standards are organized into major categories, whether that's integrative design, location and neighborhood fabric, water conservation, energy efficiency, etc. So within each of those categories are a number of specific measures some of which are mandatory, you have to do them. On the checklist, it's all the yes, no elements. And others which can be incorporated to earn optional points. All those on the checklist noted with a number. Now, compliance with the standards is achieved by integrating all mandatory measures into your project, as well as achieving the requisite number of optional points based on the project scope. 
So it's important to note that for rehab projects, the standards only apply to what will be impacted by construction. So if you're just changing out a toilet, you don't have to go and change the rest of the building. That toilet has to meet the standard related to bathroom fixtures, which says it needs to be water efficient. Well, it turns out that toilets already have to be water efficient. These may just be slightly more water efficient, but they're widely available. Uh, again, there's a column on the checklist that says, mark if it's not applicable. You can go through some projects, 98% of the uh, measures listed will not be applicable because of the scope of your project. So the checklist is what gets submitted to the building department when you submit for your permit. And the standards, the Green Development Workbook, provide you the detailed guidance you need to comply with each individual measure. So here's an example of what you'll find in the workbook itself. Now this measure requires Energy Star appliances for all projects. Now this one is short, others may be a page or two, and include a lot of details. But you can see that we've included in each measure a rationale, recommendations, requirements, and then resources with links to other websites that can give you more information. So for each individual measure. Now, to ensure healthy indoor air quality, the standards call for paints and finishes that are free of toxic chemicals. To save water, toilets and other bathroom fixtures must be water efficient. And projects can earn optional points by building to super energy efficient passive house standards or by, by providing access to outdoor space for vegetable gardening. And dozens of additional measures span energy, water, environment and health. So back to the sort of the timeline of this program. In May of 2013, the Green Building Ordinance I mentioned earlier was introduced by Mayor Spano and improved unanimously by our City Council, which established a policy for the city to design and construct its own facilities to be sustainable and to, com and to encourage commercial and residential developers to do the same. In June of 2013, Commissioner of Planning Development Wilson Kimball formally adopted the Un uh, Yonkers Green Development Workbook, including the checklist and standards to guide this policy. Now, what this ordinance says is that new construction, major renovation of city-owned facilities and schools must comply with the standards. And this is significant because the city owns well over 100 city and school buildings some of which are massive. In fact, the city spends $12 million in energy costs annually for its city and school buildings. Some of these buildings, like school buildings, they cost $650,000 in energy costs per year. Other buildings, $400,000 a year in energy costs. $400,000. So think about how much energy we're wasting year after year after year, not having the improvements made to those buildings meet some energy efficiency standards. So over time, green building strategies, including energy efficiency upgrades, will help reduce the city's operating costs. Here's an example of some of the buildings that uh, are covered by this project. This is just a subset of some of the city's buildings. Now, the Green Building Ordinance from May of 2013, it also says that certain private develop development, this is citywide, must submit a green development checklist with their site plan applications. Now, again, this is a citywide policy. If you're building a non-residential development greater than 15,000 square feet, or a residential development greater than 25 units, for private development outside the downtown, submitting a completed checklist with your site plan application is the only requirement. Now actual compliance with the standards is encouraged, but it's purely voluntary. And the mayor has taken this a step further and required that all projects receiving city economic development incentives are also required to submit a green checklist. Now, Real estate development 
is a high stakes undertaking. Project approvals are critical to getting financing and to breaking ground. And if the developer wants everything to go smoothly in front of the planning board and the city council, at a minimum, their checklist is going to show compliance with the standards. Now, if the developer really wants to hit it out of the park, you know, they're going to far exceed the standards. And this is what I've seen in the, in the dozens of checklists that we've received since the program was implemented a year ago. And it's important for the city to be able to say to the development community and others that this is what green means to us. That way, we're transparent and we're consistent and the developer gets some certainty about what our expectations are. Now, in downtown Yonkers, the standards apply to all construction projects, large and small except for those associated with one and two family homes. But the standards are applied differently for new construction, substantial rehab, or moderate rehab. Now a substantial rehab is like a gut rehab and it's defined as a project that includes the replacement and or improvement of all major systems of the building, including its envelope. So the building envelope is defined as the air barrier and thermal barrier that separates exterior from interior space, the exterior wall. So for substantial rehab projects, this can include either removing material down to the studs or structural ma masonry on one side of the exterior wall. So that's what constitutes a substantial rehab. Now on the other hand, a moderate rehab is defined as a project that does not include major systems or building envelope work as described in substantial rehab. But the most important thing is that if there's one thing you take away from today's info session, it's that if you're going in for a building permit for a project in downtown, you need to comply with the standards. And you need to download the Yonkers Green Development Workbook to understand exactly what needs to happen in order for you to comply. But beyond that, city staff, myself, Commissioner Schneider, Lee, planning director, we are all available to help to sit with you, meet with you, look at your project very closely, and go through step by step what needs to happen in order to get uh, you uh, into compliance. So compliance with the standards is a two-step process with step one occurring before the building permit is granted, and step two occurring after the construction end date. Now in the first step, a building permit will not be issued without presenting a completed green development standards checklist that meets the requirements of the standards. Now, projects must meet all applicable mandatory measures and achieve the requisite number of optional points for that construction type. Now, for this new construction projects, they must achieve 35 optional points. Substantial rehabs must achieve 30 points. And then moderate rehabs must achieve a minimum of 20% of the optional points that are available to that project based on the project scope. So that's a lot of technical details. And I don't expect you to retain it all. But it's there in the workbook to help you through the process. Now, in the second step, after construction is complete, a certificate of occupancy won't be granted until the pre-occupancy compliance report is approved by the Department of Housing and Buildings, describing how work was completed in conformance with the approved Green Development Standards checklist. So you submit the checklist, you go to construction, at the end you say, this is what we did, this is how we did it, he says, OK, and then you get your certificate of occupancy. The compliance report includes a statement signed by the registered design professional certifying that the project complies with the standards. And during the construction process, if something changes to the approved checklist, including you want to substitute green development measures, you have to submit that in writing, and there's a form and uh, Commissioner Schneider will, will most likely mention that in a few minutes. 
but he needs to review and approve that before construction is commenced. As Brad mentioned, uh, when you do changes, if you decide to change things in your checklist that uh, just you wanted to do something different that's still available to you, uh, you would file that on an amendment form, which is available on our website. It's the same as any other change you make in a building permit. It change a, a door type or any type of piece of equipment, you have to file an amended plan. Same thing here, you just file an amendment and then we'll review it and approve it. So, if any requirements of the Yonkers Green Development Standards are found to be less stringent than existing codes, the requirements of the New York State Building Code and Yonkers Zoning Code and Health Code and everything else shall take precedence. This uh, concludes uh, the Green Standards Information Sessions. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>